to be our first speaker for tonight. Dr. Nalini Mohabir is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University, Montreal. Her research interests focus on Caribbean studies, indentureship, diaspora, and decolonization. She has edited special issues and published in various journals, including Wasafiri, SX Salon, and Small, Small Acts. She is co-editor, along with Ronald Cummings, of the FIRE That Time, Black tran Transnational Radicalism and the Sir George Williams Occupation 2021. Welcome, Dr. Nalini. Thank you so much, Lindana Laguerre, Marie Wells, uh, everybody who's uh, watching here tonight, and especially my big thanks, um, heartfelt thanks to Peter Antoine from the IPE and to my brilliant uh, doctoral student, Tesfra Peterson, for um, inviting me to share in this space with you. It really is such an important space for those of us who are in the diaspora to be able to connect with people back home. Um, it means a lot to uh, share in this groundings and to share this virtual space with the wizard as well. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. So I see this as uh, groundings. And I'm just gonna um, take a moment to share my screen with you. Um, sorry, just one moment. Okay. All right, so I'm, I say groundings because I follow the teachings of Walter Rodney, uh, who is a Ghanaian scholar activist, as I'm sure you all know, um, and my source of inspiration, maybe in the same way um, that Louise Little is your source of inspiration. I feel a personal connection to Walter Rodney because my family is from Guyana. And so um, I wanna begin with thinking about what he taught us about groundings. So to think about how we might sit together to reason in the community um, and how that um, important uh, sitting down together can help us break the, in his words, imperialist worldviews that are historically white racist. So again, following in the footsteps of Louise Little. So I'm happy to be here to think with you and to think outside of the Eurocentric views that were in service of empire and capitalism in the days that Louise Little received a colonial education in Grenada and to be able to think um, outside of those, um, those walls and to create something new and to ask new questions with you. So to do that, I wanna think about three moments that I think uh, connects Canada to Grenada directly and helps us also think about why we should think about the past in our present day struggles. So the first moment that I, I want to recall is the 1969 occupation of Sir George Williams University, which is now called Concordia University and it's where I'm speaking to you from today. It's located in Montreal. And this student occupation of Sir George Williams University was organized uh, by Caribbean students um, who were studying here as international students in 1969. So in 1969, black students from the Caribbean, many of whom were here because they had set their sights on medical school and then dreamed of returning home to contribute to the ongoing project of decolonization they were enrolled in a biology class here um, in Montreal. And this biology class was a prerequisite if they wanted to go to med school. And you can imagine, as we all know, not just anybody you know, is an international student in 1969 from the Caribbean. These were high achieving students to be able um, to take that journey. Yet they were systematically failed by a young white 
and at least by one account, conservative and unpopular professor, uh, Dr. Perry Anderson. So there were six students who made a formal complaint. And again, we salute the courage that it took to make a formal complaint um, against the university. And I just wanna name these students and recognize them each individually. These six students who filed the complaint were Kennedy Fredericks from Grenada, Alan Brown, Wendell Gooden, and Douglas Mossop from Jamaica, Terence Ballantyne from Trinidad, and Rodney John from St. Vincent. They sought, um, in filing this complaint, they sought an administrative avenue to address the pattern of racism that they saw that saw bright Caribbean students systematically failed. However, the university's response was to stall and to carefully manage their requests for action. So that meant that the students had no choice but to take action themselves. So they took command of the computer center and demanded that their complaints about racial discrimination be taken seriously. And in this image here, what you see are students uh, protesting. Um, part of what they did in um, occupying the computer center in 1969. So in 1969, those computers would have been the gigantic IBM computers, which used punch cards. And here we see um, punch cards and computer paper being thrown out the window of the university. So, sorry. Um, this occupation of the students uh, of the computer center lasted for two weeks from January 29th, 1969 to February 11th, 1969. So we just passed the anniversary. And it didn't end until Montreal's riot police stormed the building. And this is a contentious moment because the students were under the impression that an agreement was being reached with the administration. So without their knowledge, the university's administration behind the backs of the students called the police. They called the riot police. And a fire ensued. We don't know how, how this fire was set. We don't know the cause of it but we do know the effects of it. This is an image here of the computer center destroyed beyond recognition due to the fire. So there was never any investigation um, or any inquiry into this fire, but you can imagine what it must have been like to be inside a computer center where a fire is set to this degree of damage. The students themselves had to hack their way out of the computer center with an emergency ax. Yet journalists such as uh, Dorothy Eber, who wrote a book called The Computer Party, um, which is how she termed their, dismissively termed their protest, uh, focused uh, so journalists like her focused on the damage to property rather than um, what might have happened to the students, the danger to their lives posed. But we do have firsthand accounts from the student protesters themselves um, who together um, offered a series of essays in an um, edited book by Dennis Forsyth. One of those students, Leroy Butcher, questions the blame cast on students, such as calling it a riot or a computer party. And he tells us, quote, the police locked the back door and tied the door with a rope. And one must wonder whether the fire had anything to do with the students at all. For with the treatment given to the students under arrest, one wonders if this fire was not meant for them to be killed. So this is the gravity of this protest. And they wrote this book um, 
to document their experiences in Montreal. And to document these experiences together means that they were thinking together and they were thinking about future generations, who they wanted to know what happened. So in 2019, a group of us, mostly Caribbean academics here at Concordia University, as well as community workers, cultural workers, um, we got together to organize a two week series of events called Protests and Pedagogy. And this was to mark the 50th anniversary of that student protest, very much um, in line with the work that you're doing in Lidi community to, to honor the history that we've inherited. So this two weeks of events included um, an exhibition, a series of film screenings, workshops, panel discussions, and a two-day conference. We wanted to facilitate meaningful dialogue about the lessons and legacies of this protest, including the ebb and flow of radical transformations, the development of Black community organizations in Montreal that came out of this moment, as well as the resistance that came out of this moment across the Caribbean, the legacies of loss and personal disorientation for those who were involved in the protest, those whose futures were curtailed, by the actions of the university's administration um, or by um, arrests or threats of deportation. So this book, um, The Fire That Time, Transnational Black Radicalism and the Sir George Williams Occupation that I edited with uh, Ronald Cummings, who's professor um, at McMaster University here in, in Canada, in Ontario, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, originally from Jamaica and actually is currently in Jamaica right now. Um, this book comes out of the work um, of protests and pedagogy of those conference conversations and interventions that happened um, with present day students, but also with the original student protesters whom we invited back to Concordia, some of whom that was the first time that they ever set foot in the university 50 years later. Um, and they were in their 70s and 80s. And I think that that moment um, of them coming to, to reason with us has led to the present day moment in which the university recently made an apology to the protesters um, for their actions. So, In, sorry. In coming together, we were trying to build a space for people who have the Caribbean as an inheritance, as I do, um, and to think together, to think um, in a way that required us to listen to those who came before us, to listen to the difficult histories and disparate parts of that history, and to take all those stories seriously. We thought it was important to commemorate the 1969 protest because we felt it hadn't been given um, the attention it deserved or the proper context. Um, of, and that context is the intersecting histories of the struggles for civil rights. Again, um, we see these connections here uh, between the protests in Montreal and the civil rights protests, the struggles of Malcolm X uh, and Martin Luther King, the black power movements of the 1960s, the political and cultural struggles for decolonization, which took place in the middle of the 20th century. And as uh, Tesfer Peterson recently informed me, also leads to connections to the Grenada Revolution. Um, as well as the 1970 Black Power uprising in Trinidad and the 1970 student occupation of the Creative Arts Center at the University of the West Indies at Mona campus in Jamaica. So all these events take place um, across university campuses um, in the US, in the Caribbean, as well as in Europe. So we can think about the ways in which the university is transformed by these demands from Caribbean students for the inclusion of Black and Caribbean knowledge within the curriculum. 
So um, Dr. Cummings and I think about this complex historical, racial, and political frame in our work through that idea of the Black, of transnational Black radicalism that helps us trace the way ideas traveled uh, between Canada and the Caribbean, as well as across the Caribbean. So close to um, 100 students, 97 students to be precise, were arrested um, following that uh, protest, following that moment when the university called the police on the students. This is an image of Valerie Belgrave from Trinidad, um, who went on to be uh, a writer, an artist um, in Trinidad being arrested by Montreal police. And um, it was not just her, of course, there were students from Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, Grenada, uh, St. Vincent, who were studying on international student visas, who were threatened with deportation. There was a trial um, of these students and their trial was covered by the international press, including um, the New York Times and other uh, newspapers. And those newspapers had headlines about the trials and the treatments of Caribbean students um, on their front page, as well as uh, newspapers in the Caribbean, which also followed closely the development of the trial. And because I'm speaking to you in Grenada, I wanted to focus on one of those students specifically, and that is Kennedy Fredericks. This is an image of Kennedy Fredericks uh, from Petite Martinique, Grenada. He was one of the leaders of the protests and here he is speaking um, in, uh, in Sir George Williams University here in Montreal, um, speaking to the students. He was one of the six students who filed the original complaint against the university. And according to Paul Hebert, Kennedy Fredericks took the name Omawali a Yoruba honorific that had also been bestowed on Malcolm X. So Omawali or Kennedy Fredericks faced, um, oh sorry, was a vocal advocate for the rights of students. And because of that, he paid a price. He faced one of the strongest charges of all the students arrested. He was charged with extortion. Because of that, his bail was set extraordinarily high by the, by the Canadian government. They asked for $20,000 in Canadian dollars for his bail in 1969. However, he managed to make bail. He did that with the help of the black community here and abroad through students as well as his own savings. So he was able to make bail because he had the extraordinary support of, black of the black community who feared that he would suffer grave consequences in a Canadian court of law. And uh, at this time, the death penalty was still on the books in Canada. So he fled Canada to Tanzania and then returned to Grenada. This is his daughter. Nantali Ndongo, who resides here in Montreal. She's a prominent figure uh, in the Montreal cultural landscape. She has a show on the national radio, CBC, and it's also a member of the musical group, Nomadic Massive. She's featured in the film about the Sir George Williams so-called affair. Um, the film is called The Ninth Floor. It's produced by the National Film Board here in Canada. And it's available on YouTube if anybody wants to watch it. The film, The Ninth Floor, documents the student protests and the toll um, the, the protests and the aftermath took on students. In the film, Nantali Ndongo talks about her father. And she says, I didn't really grow up with my dad because of how his life panned out after that incident. So here she's referring to the fact that he had to flee Canada. And she goes on to explain, quote, I grew up with this image of this amazing militant activist type who is really smart and courageous. But when I speak to my family about him, my mother says they were just students who wanted to be treated fairly. 
Her father suffered a great deal. He suffered from stress and depression caused by the events in Montreal. And we know that the stories of the way he and the other students suffered are not the kind of stories that were circulating in the media. These were not the stories that are recorded in the archives, but they remain with us because the, the children of those protesters speak out, because there's a network of love and caring relations that keep these memories alive, that are ready to tell us these stories whenever we're ready to receive them. They hold it for us and they help us remember whose shoulders we stand on. And I say that as a Caribbean person who teaches a course on Caribbean geography to 200 students here at Concordia University. Um, and I teach that um, in collaboration with Tasper Peterson, who's given two guest lectures in this course. That course would not be possible. And I say that very adamantly, it would not be possible if that path wasn't cleared for us by those student protesters from the Caribbean in 1969. I should also say that Grenada within this history lives on in literature. This book, Dominoes at the Crossroads, is a collection of short stories by the Montreal-based writer Kai Kello, who like me also has Guyanese roots, um, but lives in Montreal. So uh, his short story collection, Dominoes at the Crossroads, is underpinned by the life in the afterlife of Blackness in Montreal, at the crossroads of histories, languages, and diasporas. In the short story, Ashes and Juju, he imagines a young Black woman, a graduate student here in Montreal, completing a dissertation on the Grenada Revolution, who is also thinking about the 1969 occupation and calls attention to the ways in which slated renovations in the building where you saw the punch cards uh, being thrown out the window, um, where renovations might seek to erase a history that doesn't want us to remember this history. But storytelling is another example of the possibilities for a process of community and dialogue between those in the academy and uh, with the wider public that gives us creative cross fertilizations where we can let these readings talk back to us and help us remember. So Grenada is very much in our consciousness when we think of, um, of the connections between 1969 and Montreal's black community and continuing questions over Canadian Caribbean relations. And when we were thinking about uh, the book, The Fire That Time, we were also thinking about how it is important to us to define our own sources of strength and, and power and knowledge. And so um, I'm inspired by the work of Ladigue, of the Ladigue community. And I want to um, just take a moment. Um, I can't uh, say it any better than Lindana Laguerre did. That was an incredible um, opening remarks uh, that summed up the life of uh, Louise Langdon Little for us. Um, and I've uh, learned about her work through your work, through uh, Tesfer Peterson. And I just want to take note that in the New York Times obituary, um, for Louise uh, Langdon Little. Uh, they, they tell us at about 21, she embarked alone on a journey of more than 3000 miles from the port of St. George and Grenada to Montreal. So I just wanna take a moment to remember and pay respects for those momentous journeys that um, women were taking in those days um, out of the Caribbean to other, um, to other places in North America. Keisha Bain uh, writes about the way in which Louise Little shaped the ideas of her son. And Tesfa Peterson uh, recently organized What Can Grenada Teach Us here at Concordia University? And um, in, in that event, uh, Professor Merle Collins and Dr. Lori Lambert were in conversation and were reminding us of the ways in which history, politics, um, and um, 
geographies in terms of understanding our place in the world can unfold around the kitchen table with the women in our lives, mothers, sisters, daughters, tanties. So, you know, that is also um, a source of inspiration for me in thinking about the necessary ingredients that we need to make our past work for our future. What we need is the energy of women's stories that um, metabolize um, from the past into the present and into the future and help us understand that this is not a passive process. These are the stories that we must listen to that are passed on to us. Um, that also help us define who we are. Professor Greg Carr at Howard uh, University likens it to um, each person in our community building um, a pyramid, but brick by brick. So we need to know, he says, when to bring our brick, when to lay it down, um, how we might use that process of building together as a foundational way of doing things, a foundational way by bringing our bricks and building together, we might break through and create something different. We might ask different questions of our history um, and what, have been, what has been done before us. So in thinking about that and thinking about the kinds of frameworks that we build together here in dialogue and in community, um, I want to ask in thinking with the spirit of Louise Little, um, and this is the third moment that I think connects Canada to the Caribbean, I want to, to ask or maybe pose a provocation around current events. Um, in Canada, we've um, the CBC, again, the national broadcaster, has reported that Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau has recently met with CARICOM leaders to discuss the situation in Haiti. We've seen news that the Haitian Prime Minister, as well as the US, is calling for a Canadian intervention, and Canada has deployed naval vessels to Haiti. Recently, in a conversation I had with my collaborator in Curacao, Jermaine Ostiana, we've been discussing um, Caribbean um, reactions um, to this moment and also in general to ordinary Haitians who might be seeking a space of refuge in this moment. And I know um, through TESFA that there was recently a moment reported in Grenada of 15 Haitians uh, who came as tourists and were deported from Grenada. And we know that that has happened in other Caribbean countries as well. So I want to think about how we might cultivate relationships across the Caribbean. The students in 1969 in Montreal were doing that actively in that they were uh, through long distance phone calls reporting to their comrades. Um, at UWE Mona, at UWE Cave Hill, UWE St. Augustine, what was happening here. So there was a direct line of two-way communication. But I also want to think about you um, in Grenada and also what Grenada represents to us here in diaspora. Because who knows better in recent memory of what foreign intervention means than Grenada. And I wonder, um, and this is the provocation um, as we sit here in community, I wonder what it might look like for the Grenada Reparations uh, Committee, for example, to make a statement on this idea of foreign intervention. And I say that because I feel like I've been learning from the Grenada Reparations um, Committee uh, and the incredible strides and successes that they've had recently. And also the fearlessness of the questions that they have posed to um, the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Um, and here I'm thinking of the question raised about the, um, the leadership of 
a reparations commission that depends on somebody who has accepted a knighthood um, from Britain and whether that impedes certain hard questions from being asked. And I, I look to Grenada um, to ask those hard questions. And I think we all do in the diaspora. So I'm going to end it there. Dr. Nalini, for your riveting presentation and your thought